I'm Jim Stogdell. I'm here to talk to you about open source software in the Defense Department. And as background, I've been a defense contractor for about five years now. And I can't talk to you about everything I'm working on. <laughs> but I would like to talk to you about why I advocate open source software in the Defense Department and government in general. And um, the reasons are a number, but mostly what I'm hoping for is that government will not only consume open source software, but begin to produce it in a very broad community that extends outside of its own boundaries. And I'm not the only one advocating open source software and defense. I know you can't really read this, but the U.S. Congress has just written it into a law uh, to advocate for it. And what they're really interested in is interoperability, um, less dependence on a single vendor, flexibility, those sorts of things, and especially lower cost. I think those are good things, but I think there are deeper, more interesting reasons that make this an important thing to pursue. And I haven't talked about this publicly because people think I'm crazy, but I'm doing it tonight. And, but let me just give you a little bit of context for it before I dive into the reasons. So during the Second World War, our defense acquisition system became very centralized as part of the general mobilization at the time. And during the Cold War, that trend continued. And Dwight Eisenhower called this the military industrial complex. And he gave a cautionary speech about it just before he left office. And during that speech, he said, until the latest of our world conflicts, the United States had no armaments industry. American makers of plowshares could, with time and as required, make swords as well. But now we have been compelled to create a permanent armaments industry of vast proportions. He went on to say, I got a little ahead of myself. He went on to say, we should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of, the, of defense with our peaceful methods and goals so that security and liberty may prosper together. So here we are nearly 50 years after he gave that speech, and what we have inherited is a very isolated military industrial complex with its own um, culture, its own technology, its own processes, even its own economy. <laughs> I went to Texas. And <laughs> inside the circle you find things like CMMI, systems engineering, top-down planning, um, and, and frankly a almost nationalized industrial complex. Well outside the circle where the rest of us work and live, we have the web, open source software, agile software development, and emergent processes, things like that. So inside the moat where government lives, they and their contractors don't always get along very well. <laughs> And in fact, it's sort of a suboptimal Nash equilibrium, a prisoner's dilemma writ large, where nobody ever gets what they want, and they're always kind of pissed off about it. <clears throat> Which brings me back to why I advocate open source software in defense. Open source software is a culture virus. It's a zero-day exploit of the membrane that separates us from our government, and it carries with it alternative cultural norms. Policy is dictated, but culture emerges in an organization. And open source software can trigger that cultural emergence as community participants find their perspectives, their worldviews, and even sort of their psychographic profiles spliced in with those community norms. Things like transparency, collaboration, and a strong bias towards meaningful participation. As individuals absorb this virus, they become carriers and hosts to it themselves, and they carry it deeper into the organizations in which they work. And they don't just change the way the organizations build software, they change the way the organizations function. And over time, I think that this boundary between us and our government will become more permeable, and it'll seem less like a real boundary, and that's what I'm hoping for. Now, this communication, the communication pathways through that boundary will be established in two directions. They won't be one directional. So if you participate in one of these conversations or one of these open source communities, don't expect that you'll be unchanged in the transaction either. Uh, as the culture and technology crosses the boundary, I'm hopeful the trust will cross the boundary as well. And someday you might find yourself using the word us in a context you never imagined. Philosopher and mathematician Norbert Wiener once said about these communication feedback loops, we are but whirlpools ever flowing, of ever flowing water. We are not stuff that abides, but patterns that perpetuate themselves. And I hope that open source software and government will be a mechanism for establishing and perpetuating patterns that are better than the ones we have today. Participation is key in all this. With it, we can not only influence emergent culture, but we can codify, po codify policy as well. Lawrence Lessig likes to say that code is law, and I think if he's right, then an open source developer working on a government um, open source project will be a legislator. So where might all this lead? Well, this is a picture of a fractal. Fractals are mathematical constructs that um, have self-similarity across scale. And I know this might sound kind of odd, but I think people are fractals too. And I think the attributes that are exhibited at the scale of a single human being <laughs> will we'll be, we'll be exhibited again at greater scale when groups of like-minded people come together. And I think, again, at even greater scale, as our government and the departments that make it up begin to adopt a different persona, one that engages differently in the world. And anyway, that's my plan. I hope you all are like, thank you very much. <laughs>